welcome to Right Now Workshop Podcast, where you can write a book and change the world. I'm your host, Kitty Buholtz, and this is episode 111, Lessons from a Long Career, an interview with Thomas Locke, coming to you on Thursday, November 22nd, 2018. If you are an American, happy Thanksgiving! You are maybe not even listening to this episode on the day it releases because you are probably getting ready to eat lots and lots of food and you're probably cooking and or watching football and or watching other people cook and watch football, which is what I tended to do quite a lot the last few years when I was with families who... They are so big. There were so many people in the kitchen. It was like, why don't I just sit over here out of the way? So whatever you're doing today, I hope you're having fun. And if you're doing nano, you might be doing what I occasionally did, which was, I'll just be in this other room for a while. Call me when it's time to eat. (laughs) So if you're doing that, you are also probably not listening on Thursday, but I hope you're having a really good time. My writing is going well-ish, so kind of well, meaning that I was about eight or 10,000 words into the book when I saw a Hallmark movie that was almost exactly the book that I was writing. Now, I am currently writing a spec novel to send to Hallmark during their February 2019 open submission period, and I decided that I was going to do a Christmas story. So I wrote a Christmas story that like literally it's scary how similar it was to the plot of a movie that they already aired sometime in something like November 2017. I just hadn't seen it yet. So there were a few days when I was like, okay, back to the drawing board. We're doing a page one rewrite, which is good because I was only like, you know, less than 10,000 words into it. So now I kind of sort of know what I'm doing and also not so much. I still have to do some more plotting, but I'm having fun. So that's something, right? And because it's nano season, I'm like, okay, I'm absolutely going to make a 100 word per day minimum limit because I can't just sit around going, I need to come up with a new plot. I need to just keep writing it until I, uh, yeah. Everybody has their own way of doing it. And for me, I need to tell myself, you're going to write something, my dear, every day. Even if you're like, one day I stopped in the middle of a sentence, which I normally don't do. I talked about this on another episode with someone uh, because I was like, okay, um, I hit my 100, 100 words, yay. And, um, and it was something like, uh, this used to be the historic building of, and I was like, I don't know, I'll think about it while I sleep and then I'll come up with some historic cool thing about this old building, which I still haven't figured out. I just kept on writing. <laughs> so whatever you're doing, I hope that you are having fun, enjoying yourself. Remember that uh, how much fun you're having writing the book, it's going to be very similar to the amount of fun that readers are having reading it. So keep your joy going. Now, this interview, I'm telling you, I'm pretty sure that I am at some point going to sit down with a pen and paper and listen to it again and take notes because Thomas Slack a.k.a. Davis Bunn, is just such a brilliant teacher. And he's one of those people that you could just sit down in a coffee shop with him and just listen, just turn him on and let him go because it's going to be interesting and super helpful. And you'll be like, oh, that's a great idea. Or, oh, that's so inspiring. Or, oh, that makes me feel better about me, my process, my way of doing things. Um, just No matter what he's saying, you're like, Oh yeah, that's good. I like that. And he's got this lovely voice, so he's wonderful to listen to. And so let's get into it. You are going to really enjoy this interview. And seriously, I strongly encourage you to uh, save this episode. You can do that on your podcast app. Did you know that? Um, and and come back to it and make some notes about the things that really hit you. But listen to it once just for the joy of you know sitting there listening to somebody talk in a coffee shop sort of thing. We weren't, of course, in a coffee shop. <laughs> I was in Sweden and he was in someplace else. I can't remember where he was right the, at this moment. I think he might have been in Florida. Um, 
but you are going to have a great time. So relax, get a cup of tea or you know some eggnog and uh, enjoy the interview. Have a great writing week. And again, no matter who you are, where you live or what you celebrate, happy Thanksgiving. There is always a ton of things to be grateful for. Um, I should just have an episode where we start talking about all the things we're grateful for, but it wouldn't really be a dialogue, would it? It would only be me telling you. So sit down and think for a minute about all the great things that are happening in your life. And just know that I can Consider you one of the things that I'm grateful for in my life. I'm glad that you're enjoying this podcast. I do it for you as well as, you know, a little bit for me. I enjoy it. But if there was no you listening to it, then there would be no point in me doing it. So remember that I'm grateful for you. Other people are grateful for you. And see how that fits into your writing somewhere this week. All right. Talk to you later. Today's guest is Thomas Locke, a pseudonym for Davis Bunn. Davis's novels have sold in excess of 8 million copies in 24 languages. He has appeared on numerous national bestseller lists, and his titles have been main or featured selections with every major U.S. book club. In the past 12 months, Davis has had multiple titles featured as top picks by Library Journal, Publishers Weekly, RT Reviews, and Booklist. In 2014, Davis was granted the Lifetime Achievement Award by the Christie Board of Judges. Recently, Trial Run was named Best Book of the Year by Suspense Magazine. In February, America's number one talk show host, Delilah, named Firefly Cove her book of the month. In March, the national magazine Mary Jane's Farm named Firefly, Firefly Cove one of their top 10 books of 2018. In the past several weeks, Reader's Digest has acquired worldwide rights to his latest series, Miramar Bay. Welcome, Thomas. Firefly Cove is such a tough thing to say. I, I just I dread <laughs> doing the interviews on that because every time I do, I, at least once in the interview, I'll get it wrong. Yeah. Firefly Cove. <laughs> Thank you. It's great to be oh. here. Oh, thank you so much for being here. Now, tell us a little bit, because I'm going to be calling you Thomas, because the book we're going to talk about is written by Thomas Locke. So tell us a little bit about pen names and why and how you chose one. Okay, um, I'm going to address your the audience members that are writers, so that I'm talking about this in more technical terms, and I'm going to probably bore everyone else to death, but I think <laughs> that may be the best thing to do, just explain that in the beginning. Um, to understand what's happened, I need to go back to the earliest days of my writing. I ran a consulting company based in Germany, starting when I was age 28. And during the time that I was learning how to write, which started the next year, uh, I was in two and sometimes three countries every week with my day job. So I wrote for nine years and finished seven books before my first was accepted for publication. And by the time I was finally able to live from my writing, it was like someone had taken this lead weight off of my feet and I could finally just fly. So as a result of learning that discipline that was required to maintain the writing during all of the difficulties I had early on, and all of the reasons to quit. Um, basically, since the third or fourth book came out after I was able to live from the writing, so say uh, we're talking about 1995, 96, since then I have done a minimum of four full length books each year. Wow. Now, soon after I got to that point of just you know, this was my normal course. Jeanette Oak and I teamed up and I wrote for 10 years. I did a minimum of one book and usually two books a year with her, plus my own titles. But Jeanette's health, finally, we did uh, 14 books together. Unfortunately, her health uh, about four years ago got to the point where she had to stop writing. And um, by the time her health started de declining, there was this feeling with both of us that uh, it really was a, uh, a wake-up call for me that I needed to be very clear that this, 
this is just part of the passage, you know, and there is a finite end to my creative life. Hopefully it's not coming anytime soon, but (laughs) the question is, what are the things that I wanted to do that I hadn't? Because that was actually why Jeanette started working with me. She'd had some health issues and she wanted to try marrying her a very intimate emotional story structure with my greater sense of drama. And the two things that I wanted to do that I had not done were writing science fiction and fantasy, which was my first love as a kid, and writing for film. Actually, it was six years ago. It was not four years ago. Six years ago. And so since then, I have been working in those two directions. Now, as far as the science fiction and fantasy is concerned, I wrote what are called spec novels. In other words, going back to the days before I was a full-time writer and was still struggling to find a contract, I wrote three full-length novels with no contract and no, no chance, as far as I knew, that any of these would ever see the light of day. Obviously, I hoped, but the there were two challenges. The first was to write that structure, and the second was then to find a commercial outlet. And so in writing, I chose the traditional fantasy, Emissary, which was the first one that was released. And then I did Trial Run, which was uh, a contemporary science fiction in the vein of of, uh, Michael Crichton. And then I did a second Trial Run, and had started on the sequel to Emissary. All of this simply from the passion of just, it was like this, boom, I was so excited to have a chance to go into this area that I loved so much. And while I was writing the, the sequel to, and basically what I was doing was I was writing the books, the Davis Bunn books that were under contract, And this was my downtime. This was what I was doing on my days off. So when I had a day off, I would go back. I was like, oh, I can't wait. I'm going to do another one. (laughs) Merchant of a List was the story uh, that I had been working on at that time. And the head of sales for the Baker Publishing Group came. He's a friend. And he came down. We had lunch together. And I told him what I was doing with my spare time. And he said, well, I like science fiction. Let me see it. And he took it back to the president of the company. And they said, okay, we want to try and use these novels, what became the Thomas Locke novels, as an opportunity for a Christian house to move into the mainstream because of all of the difficulties in the publishing world. They felt that having this new direction because there is a strong moral structure to the stories, it would give them a chance to sort of plant their flag in a new arena. And so that was, but they said, we want you to commit to doing a minimum of nine stories for us. So it would be three traditional fantasy, three in the trial run contemporary sci-fi series, and then three YA novels. And um, I said, oh, obviously, I said, <laughs> I said, hallelujah. Of course, I'll, yeah. and it's, oh, yes, okay, I'll, I'll think about that. But yes, <laughs> that's what happened. Wow. Okay, now, I don't know if you knew. I, I don't know how it happened. I ended up on your advanced reader team and read and reviewed Emissary and Trial Run, both of which oh. I was like, Oh my gosh. And I am a huge fan of The Great Divide, which was uh, on sale for 99 cents as an ebook last week or so. That's right. And so I'm, That's right. They re released it on ebook. Yeah. 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 And I'm thinking, what? my gosh, my friend knows. <laughs> <laughs> so many different types of stories. And yet, you know, there's still the same, the element I love in all of your stories is that no matter what's happening, like in, in, Enclave. Am I saying that right? I had to look it up yeah. because I, uh, I realized I'd been saying it wrong. Uh, so in Enclave, the new book that just came out two days ago when this goes uh, live on the air, uh, all of your stories have this great feeling of characters who are stuck in a situation or faced with a situation that um, some of these situations seem just untenable. Like this is not a situation anyone would want to be in or live through or get through, but you just have to. But they still have this like moral gut to them that 
helps them to figure out what they're going to do and how they're going to make up for mistakes when they do make a mistake. And I love this about your stories. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so honestly, listeners, if you haven't read any of the Davis Bunner Thomas Locke novels, you totally need to because you literally have, to me, a genre for almost any listener. I mean, I read the Jeanette Oak, uh, T. Davis Bun books, and then The Great Divide. And I think you had a couple of them that had lawyers, right? Yes, Not yes. Yeah. Oh, I loved those. I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> it's like John Grisham, but with people a little bit more like me. <laughs> I, I think for the readers, sorry, for the listeners that you have that are interested in doing science fiction and fantasy, this really is the most important, well, I mean, okay, there, <laughs> it's like, whatever it is that we talk about, it's going to be the most important thing as far as <laughs> trying to get it right, getting your book to the point where it's a commercial success. But one of the biggest failings for science fiction and fantasy is to write a story that is heavy on the, the idea and poor on the characters. Mm -hmm. Because you are trying to take your audience into an arena that they could never actually know because it doesn't actually exist, the only real connection that you have is through characters that they can genuinely bond with. I think if I could just take two examples from other writers, the first fantasy beyond Tolkien, okay, so every, I think all, all fantasy readers of my generation started with this addiction to Tolkien. Once we move away from Tolkien, the first of the fantasies that really impacted me as a young teen were the Dragon Riders of Pern. Yes! Okay, and the reason why this idea of a young girl who is raising a dragon's egg and becomes the queen of the dragon riders is because you care so deeply for this person. And the writing, I mean, I've, I've gone, <laughs> it's really, it was a disappointment. I went back about three years ago and reread these as a writer with 70, at, at the time, 75 books published, and I thought, this writing is really not very good. <laughs> it didn't matter at the time, you know? It's, yeah. And it's, it's also uh, another example of the reason why of all of the dystopian novels that were coming out eight years ago, the one that rose to the surface and sold close to 100 million copies as a series was The Hunger Games. And the reason is because you care so deeply for Katniss and the, the fact that she's willing to sacrifice her life for her sister, the fact that there's this mother who is completely disassociated from her daughters, the two hunks that this woman is, this young woman is, is having to choose between. All of these things create a reality for today's teen woman in this impossible situation. And yeah. so for your audience that are planning to write in science fiction and fantasy, the core thing that you have to do is accept that this does not divorce you from the need for strong characters. It actually magnifies it. And the reason why I think this is so important is because if, if you go to a writer's convention for uh, for sci-fi and, and fantasy writers, what you find repeatedly is that, and all of us have a reason for becoming creators. In this case, for fantasy and sci-fi writers, in many cases, it's because the reality that they have known here and now has been simply too painful or too divisive in terms of separating them from whatever it is that they want to have as their emotional lifetime goal, that they effectively divorce themselves from it. And the problem is that for many of these people, making contact with other people is a very hard part of life. What happens on the page is these same people find it very difficult to create characters that live and breathe Right. And so 
I say again, it is very important that, and, and quite frankly, I have this difficulty. What you have to do is to create a way, a tool that allows you to make this contact, even if it's from a clinical standpoint where you are emotionally holding back, but you are allowing yourself to become increasingly involved in the development of three-dimensional characters. Now, what does three-dimensional mean? In terms of a writer, when you start a story, the characters need to have a motivation and an emotional structure that does two things. On the one hand, their motivation at the beginning of the story has to be different from the story's direction. In other words, the characters are looking for things that they want. They are self-obsessed. They are going in different directions. And somewhere around the end of the first act, in other words, around chapter five or six, there is some enormous event that forces them to declare either they are for or against the main thrust of the story, the main objective, whatever the climax is going to be. That's the right. one side. The other side of this is three-dimensionality means that when you are writing from this character's perspective, what is called point of view, their emotional structure on the inside clouds everything that they see and respond to out there so that everything that you're writing in a three-dimensional character reflects both the outside and the inside. And this is the hardest thing for a disassociated writer to come to terms with. Right. Now, how did I overcome this? I had a, a letter from an agent early in my career. I'd written three novels at this point, all of which have remained unpublished. And the agent said that my characters were cardboard cutouts and it deflected from the power of my story. And she was right. So I started going into, actually what she said was my characters were three-dimensional cutouts and my dialogue was one-dimensional. Oh, and painful. <laughs> yes, it was very painful. But what I started doing was I would, for a month, I put aside my fourth book, I never finished it, and started carrying a tape recorder into every contact I had with other people in the office, in conference rooms, on the trains, anywhere I was talking to someone else, I would secretly turn on this tape recorder. I taped all of these conversations, including on dates, and then went home and typed out every word. And what I found after a month of this was that I could manipulate the structure of the dialogue. I understood how these people were talking enough so that I could manipulate what they were saying to fit the role of whatever it is that I wanted to do. So I changed a very nice old woman that I knew from, from Germany. I turned her into a murderer. Wow. A, um, one of the business associates that I had and a sports friend and changed them into two dueling wizards. But really what I was trying to do was to get to the point where I owned the characters. And that to me, I think is really what you have to do is you have to get to this point where your character structure becomes a natural part of your storytelling. And then developing the story itself becomes, a, you know, it, it, it's like you have taken care of the core issue. You can now move on to the story and make it work. Yeah. I'll give one example, though, I think because it's important of what I meant by that, uh, that uh, climactic moment at the end of the first act. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, I need an example. Okay. Um, there's a, I can't remember the name of the story. It doesn't really matter what the story is called. Ken yeah. Follett. What I like to try to do with these examples is use uh, stories, they may not be great stories, but they are stories that have sold a minimum of 10 million books. Wow. Okay. 
So we're talking about things that have succeeded both with the publisher and with the audience, okay? Now, Ken Follett has written two near-time sci-fi stories. Ken Follett did To the Ends of the Earth. Um, uh, his biggest story was the, the most successful story was the one about the, the building of the cathedral, okay, which was made into a uh, uh, Showtime miniseries. But anyway, in this particular story, I think it's called White Out. Um, there is a, a lab in Scotland that is working on some genetic thing, but the woman, the main character, isn't really certain exactly what this is, but it's some secret genetic project that, she, that they're working on. And she is spending the Christmas holidays as the security guard. In other words, she's released all of her her staff and taken on this rather mundane role of being the online, uh, sorry, the, the on time, uh, on location security person through the Christmas holidays. And there's a very heavy snowstorm. And one of the reasons why she is allowing herself to become trapped inside this factory, basically by herself, is because a month earlier, she had discovered her husband, who was the chief of police of the village nearby, having an affair, and she's split. So she has no home life right now. So come the day before Christmas, her husband, her, her ex, shows up and says that he wants to get back together. And so she's got all of these conflicting things, you know, the raw wound, the emotions, the fact that she still loves this guy even though he's cheated on her, all of these things. And there's a problem that develops inside the lab. She can't tell exactly what happens at that point. But at this explosive moment, two things happen. First, she realizes that it's a very high-tech attempt to steal the technology that this company is developing. Wow. And she discovers that the reason why her husband has shown up is because he's been bribed by the thieves. Oh. Okay. So you have all of these things come together and create this momentum that propels everyone that's been named up to this point towards the climax. And you've declared what the climax is. Can she save the company? That's basically it. Yeah. So. Wow. Okay. Yes. And that's the sort of thing that we're all working towards by really investigating and knowing our characters better. Yes. That's exactly that's right. Up wow. until that point, up until the explosive moment, everyone is working on their own agenda. Yeah. And then the explosion happens. And effectively, for this woman, what it means is, are you willing to sacrifice your life and, and, your, and what's left of your marriage in order to save the company that you work for? Yeah. So that, you, you've established the stakes, and everyone then has a reason to be moving in the same direction. Right. Or against. Excellent. Wow. Okay. I, I haven't heard you teach writing stuff for a long time. You were one of the uh, first probably three or four teachers that I had when I started. And I remember always thinking, wow, that Davis Bunn, he knows how to teach writing. <laughs> <laughs> because here's the thing, Davis, you do this in your writing and you do this in your teaching. You have a gift for making the wow factor just bubble up. Like, wow, I just want to go. I want to get back to my writing. I'm sorry. Let's just cut the interview short. Okay. You know? okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Okay. So characters and really building them, understanding them and understanding how people talk and why they say the things they say the way they say it. That's got to be a huge part. You do that so well now. One of the things that I do, I, I used to do, I haven't actually been invited back and this is probably why. <laughs> I, used to, <laughs> I used to teach in high schools occasionally, I, particularly in Florida when I would be over there, I would have these invitations to go into the public school system and teach a class on what it means to be a writer. And the way that I would start is while the people, while the kids are filing into the room, I would listen to all of the dialogue that I could hear and I would write it in small 
letters. And because they don't know me, it doesn't matter what I put it up there. Nobody's going to pay attention to me in a class of teens. I write down everything that I hear them say on the blackboard. And it's interesting, in all of the classes that I've taught this way, no kid, even those sitting on the front row, have ever actually realized that's what I'm doing. Oh. I don't, maybe it's because my writing is so bad, but <laughs> they've never actually questioned this. So the teacher introduces me, and then I say, okay, I want you to hear what I heard as, as you guys were filing in and sitting down. And I read it word for word. And it's, I say, okay, what is it that you hear? What is it that you see about this? And the answer is obviously 90% of everything that's said is self-directed. It is talking about inside. And then I say, and this is the end of my introduction, but I say of all of the creative arts, if you go everything from the creative art of higher theoretical mathematics to music, to painting, to drawing, to dance, the one arena where there has never been a child prodigy is fiction. Right. Why is this? And the reason, I think, is because a child, when it enters in and goes through basically right up until puberty, they consider themselves to be the center of the universe. Now, one of the things that happens during the crisis period of the teen years is that they are gradually forced to realize that the universe does not ro rotate around them. They are part of something bigger. And finding their identity in this is necessary before they can create real identities on the page of other people. You have to separate your, yeah, I'm sure every writer out there has heard this, you have to separate yourself as the writer away from the page. You cannot exist there. It's the characters. But what does that mean? It means that the characters on the page, their emotions and their motivations, have to be so strong that the reader does not recognize the author at all. And this is where the challenge is, I think, for young writers, is understanding that they are not telling a story. They are creating characters who tell the story. Wow, this yeah. Veil, this, this emotional veil is the key to two things. It's the key to point of view where you are able to create dialogue that reveals the interior world as much as it does the outside world. But the other thing that it does is it is from this one point that you begin to create your artistic voice. This is the basis for it. Wow, I love that. I love that. Now I, you got me thinking about my stories. I'm like, where have I done it well? Where am I like, oh yeah, that, that wasn't so good. <laughs> I do that every time I hear another author that I like. The, recently, I had a chance to hear my number one screenwriting, just, oh my gosh, it's Tony Gilroy. <laughs> I was listening to everything he said and thinking, okay, where, oh gosh, I've got to go back and redo that over and over <laughs> and over again. Just... Yeah, yeah. Now, let me, let me clarify something, though. But are you saying, because I, I suspect that you're not, are you saying that a reader... If, if you've done the best possible job, a reader might not know what author wrote the story? No. No, you're not no, saying that. You, it, the, the, the artistic voice is the link between your different works. And it's like what you said when you were describing the things that you like about my work. It's whatever I do in terms of genre and so forth, there are certain things that link all of these books. And this comes through that development of the interior world of your characters. This is where it's founded. How do you do this? And in many cases, what you do is you find your own brand of poetry, some way of revealing the emotional structure of what the characters are feeling. I like it. I like it. I have to say that um, 
probably one of the nicest compliments anyone ever gave me, which was actually at uh, one of the Glorietta Christian Writers Conferences where Ken Wales was the keynote speaker. We were talking about that a little bit offline. And um, I don't remember what it was. I don't, it was a contest or it was a something. I don't know what it was. And he was reading little blurbs of work um, without saying who it was. And he read a little couple paragraphs of, of mine. And one of my friends about six rows away turns around, looks for me in the audience and she, and she points in like mouths, that's you. And I'm like, <laughs> oh my gosh, I have a voice. <laughs> but that was that's the first great. time that I really started thinking, that's right. You know, there are certain authors that when I, I don't know what it is about Amanda Quick and Jane Ann Krentz, you know, it's the same woman. I love, love, love Amanda Quick novels. And I could read four or five pages out of a novel and be like, is this Amanda Quick? Because it sounds like Amanda Quick. <laughs> but for some reason, just don't care for her Jane Ann Krentz novels, even though it's the same author. But she's gotten so good at like, this is my style and my voice with this kind of genre. And this is what it's like over there. I'm not sure that your voice is totally different or just some different. I mean, because I've read now at least four genres that you've written in. And um, when I'm in it, I, I totally feel like this is totally a Davis Bonner, Thomas Locke novel. But what are your thoughts when you're um, doing, when you're writing in different genres, particularly because you write so many books in a year? So my guess is you're writing in at least two different genres sometime during that year. Yes, a, a minimum of two different genres. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, what I think today is is probably very different from when this first started. When it first happened with uh, Jeanette, that was really the time, because up until that point, um, for the first four or five years that I was writing and being published, I was just so excited about writing anything that really whatever emotion came up at the time, I would put it down on the page. It was this sense of just finally, finally, I've got this dream that's I've been struggling for so long to see happen. And there was just this constant, just surging emotion that I just, it was like this three, four year long storm. But when I started writing with Jeanette, was also the time when I first started working on the book that led to the Great Divide. Uh, ah. the, the book before that, the thing that was like the transition point, was a historical novel called To the Ends of the Earth. And I, it was the first time that I had been required to do really, really in-depth, serious research. I'd always researched my stories, but this is one where effectively I was starting from scratch. And learning the foundations of how to apply research to a story made it so that I was ready when the opportunity to write The Great Divide for Doubleday came up. And that was the same time when I started the first book with Jeanette. And what I found then was that I had to find, it wasn't just that there was this very distinct separation between a historical adventure and writing Jeanette Oak stories, but also the mindset that I was taking into these stories had to be split. And so I decided that I would take a couple of uh, favorite authors from each of these two genres whose work I really admired, both for the the ability that they had to create stories that drew me in, and also because they were very successful commercially. Mm -hmm. And I would use them as the foundations for making that step away from who I was and move into this world of either writing the historical drama or writing with Jeanette. And with Jeanette, it ended up being just one author. And that author was the first woman's writer who just... I mean, her work just blew me away. There was this sense of, okay, this is what I want to do. It's not romance. I'm looking for drama that has a romantic element. And her name is Maeve, M-A-E-V-E, Benchy. Oh, she right. Died, she died two years ago. Oh. Um, Maeve was, until her death, she was the biggest selling living Irish author. 
and a star in her world. I mean, just a real star. She was Barbara Bush's number one favorite author. She had a, a following on every continent in the world except Antarctica. She really, it was just an amazing ability of hers to draw in male and female writers, uh, readers, just incredible. She, her movies launched the careers of just, I mean, many drivers. A career started with one of her movies. I mean, it's really? just this incredible ability she had to create characters that were just boom. And um, it, it, was, it was literally by chance that I found her right at this point. It was in a conversation with an editor for another house where there was this, this woman said, you know, I hear what you're trying to do with Jeanette. And it wasn't, I mean, this wasn't Bethany. This wasn't our publisher. Um, she said, you know, you really need to check out Maeve Benchy. And I was like, ah, I, 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 okay. And I did it. It was like, wow, this is it. This is it. I owe this woman such a debt. <laughs> she wow. doesn't know it. She was, she left. And I haven't talked to her since then. I, I hope I had a chance to tell her before she left. That was just how much I liked her. But anyway, so the only time that I would read Maeve Benchy was in the transition point between my outside life and writing with Jeanette. And it became this thing where I would buy the Benchy books one at a time, but I would not open them until I started on this work with Jeanette. So this became the portal. This is the door that I walked through to get into that. That's a brilliant idea. I know some people um, have decided, you know, not to read in their genre at the time that they're writing, but I, um, I feel like I sort of lose um, part of, you know, we have, a, we have digital clouds now, and I feel like there's a creative cloud that we can all sort of connect to, and that when we're reading each other's work, we're also kind of making new connections, sort of like neurons in the brain firing in new ways. I think that's, I think that's true. I, it certainly does work for me. I mean, the issue here is, uh, what is your long-term intention? Because obviously during the creative process, you can't be thinking about the commercial side, money, sales, marketing, finding yeah. an editor, all of this, that can't enter in. But at the same time, you want to remain linked to this idea or this ultimate goal of having a million people buy your book. So finding someone that you can identify with who has succeeded at this, yeah. in my mind, is a very good way to move forward. Yeah, I love it. Well, you know what? I'm really glad that you agree with my opinion because then I'm going to keep on reading a lot of Jim Butcher when I'm writing my supernatural stuff. There you go. <laughs> Listen, I want to be aware of your time. You're a busy man. You've got a lot going on. Uh, but there are two quick things. Well, hopefully I won't be taking too much time if I, we cover both of them. So one is one of my favorite stories that you told at a writer's conference. And one has to do with something that you said in the press release for Enclave. And one of the things that you said was that um, you wanted to bring a sense of hope to dystopian novels. And I think that you were saying in the, in the press release that you didn't really think that there was that much hope in today's dystopian novels. Yeah, I won't criticize other novels, most of which I really enjoy. I think right. it's just a fabulous book. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I, and I, I didn't mean I, it that way. <laughs> no, 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 no. But I did want to try and write one where there was that, it, it's hope, you know, the problem with press releases is you're trying to find some way of saying this in 10 seconds or less. Right. And the, the issue that I find, the, the, the struggle that I have with a lot of the dystopian novels is that there's this sense of the moral character of the people that are involved in this breakdown. And, you know, if if we look at the foundation for dystopian fiction, it is that the young people <clears throat> feel like there is just this growing paucity of hope and tomorrow. Their, their lives for the first time in modern history are centered upon the concept that they will not do as well as their parents did financially, economically, and so forth. The concept of progress has become somewhat embittered by the environmental situation, the corruption in politics, the feeling of not being heard, their 
their needs or wants are not being met. These are the, the foundational issues. And yet, in the midst of all of this, there are very good people trying very hard to make things better. And what I find inside most dystopian fiction is these very good people with higher aims don't exist. Everything becomes reduced. It's almost, it becomes almost an excuse not to try. So what I wanted to do is to create a situation where there was a dystopian future, but to say the challenges on the personal level still exist. And that was the basis for my writing in Clay. Yeah. And um, I would say that it seems to me that your worldview and perhaps what you would want other writers to be thinking about is what is your worldview? Put it on the paper, even if other people seem to be putting a different worldview on the paper. Like, what do you want? You were talking about science fiction writers maybe writing about something that they wanted but didn't see, or, well, I don't, that's how I took it, because I was thinking, oh, I don't write science fiction, but I write about things that I want but don't see. And I think the reason why I love books that do have any, any thread of hope <laughs> near the end is that it makes me feel like the world is not as bad as, um, quote, other people are telling me it is. Yes. Yes, I think you summarized that very well. I like it. Well, listen, um, my favorite story I thought would be the best way to end the podcast. And, uh, and these two uh, lines of thought kind of intersected. So I thought we would kind of move into, there was a point at which uh, you were speaking at a writer's conference and telling us about a woman who came up to you and asked you a question that really gave you food for thought. Can you tell us about that story? Sure. It was the, um, okay, going back to the very early days, I had written for nine years, I'd finished seven books, and my first that was accepted for publication was a political thriller called The Presence. And uh, after all of these years of struggle and all the reasons I had to stop writing, we had arrived at the Christian Booksellers Convention with the announcement that um, Bethany had pre-sold somewhere around 75,000 copies of this book, and it had been named the ECPA's finalist for their Book of the Year award. That was one of five titles, and the only, it was the first time that a fiction title since Christie that had been named for this top award. And so I had moved from basically having no one even want to talk to me to being, it's like there was this spotlight that followed us everywhere we went in the convention. It was just <laughs> unbelievable. And um, the third day that I was there, we had the book signing. And um, we, my wife and I walked over towards the signing booth, which is separate from where the, the publishers are located. And there was this line that just went on and on and on and on. And no one had read my work at this point. And we thought that there was this, there was this really famous guy, this pastor that um, was in front of me. And we just assumed that his line was, and they said, no, 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 this is your line. They're all waiting for your book. Wow. <laughs> we walked behind, you know, the signing booth is this little curtained alcove. And we walked around to the entrance in the back and, the I know now what the pastor was facing at the time I didn't there was this like gosh you know I've heard this guy for years I you know I, I it's just incredible to be in the booth with him and um, he at at this point in his career had a outside publicist as well as the publisher publicist who were both there in the booth with him saying that this was you know the last four books that he could sign he had done this was 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock in the morning. He'd probably done 15 radio and television interviews before then. He had another half a dozen that he was going to be doing. And then he was going to be speaking at a church that night and he was going to be flying back and he was going to be doing the sermon the next day at his own home church. And this was his life seven days a week. Whoa. All I saw was the last four people in his line. He was scrawling his name, not even looking up and just shoving the book across the, the counter, 
you know, that was it. Just scrawl, shut the book, push it up to the next person without even seeing who it was that was getting it. And he did it with the last one. And this, it was this little gray haired Mennonite woman in her, you know, the sort of dove gray outfit with the white cap. And she, she could not have been more than five feet tall. And she reached across the counter and grabbed his wrist and held him, forcing him to look up. And she said, is this a worthy book? And his response was something to the effect that he'd been under a great deal of pressure, but he felt like he had done the absolute best that he could. And she left the book after waiting for an hour to get him to sign it. She left the book and walked away. And I felt like that it actually, the message was not for him at all, but for me, that that sense of regardless of what happens, whatever else it is that I'm facing, that there is going to be that moment when I'm required to answer that same question. Now or later, it's going to come. So I'm working on somewhere around my 80th title now to be published. I finished a manuscript yesterday and that question still resonates. It is still the crucial element that I have to be aware of and everything that, that happens, including this interview, that there needs to be that sense of the eternal worthiness of my, how I use this gift and this time. And I think one of the most beautiful things about all the different various creative forms of communication that we have is that that woman will not know until eternity how many lives she's affected because you telling the story obviously has affected me for the last, oh, I hate to say, could it have been 20 years that I've been thinking about that when I write? And then I don't know how many times you've told the story, but there had to have been 250 or 300 people listening at the time that I heard it. And I'm thinking all the people, all the creators out there, and now more people hearing it and more thousands hearing it now. And I just am thinking, this is how words change the world. Whether it's, uh, you know, 100,000 words or 17 words, you know, is your work worthy? I love it. Davis, it has been such a treat having you here. And just in case I don't get to talk to you again until we're back in heaven together, I just want to tell you, you have been a fantastic inspiration to me. You make me feel like um, there's really nothing I can't do if I try hard enough in my creative work. Good. And I just want to make sure that, like you were saying, did I ever get to tell that lady thank you for telling me about Mae Binchy? So I want to tell you thank you for all the things that you've given me and now, you know, so many other listeners here today. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me on.